And then the blades started to hit the ground. These are enormous blades, you know, they're about a metre wide. Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. The single greatest sacrifice I've made is in my family. We weren't out there to take country, we were out on your house. I did feel a lot of regret. Friends were still getting killed. It got to the point where, you know, you're going to funerals quite often. Do I leave under fire? And that was a heavy responsibility, I guess, on my shoulders that I didn't want to screw up. War itself is horrific. It's a horror story. It should never be dressed up as if it's something glorious. Not what you can do for yourself, or what can you do for your country. The volunteer for service was, in effect, to put your life on the line. Rod Henderson is an Australian Army veteran. He has served as an infantryman and in army aviation, working with Black Hawks and Chinooks, including as a door gunner. Rod has deployed on warlike and humanitarian operations to Timor, Pakistan, New Guinea and Afghanistan. He's now a volunteer guide at the Australian War Memorial. This is his conversation with Angus Horden. I'm Angus Horden, speaking today with Rod Henderson. Rod, welcome to Life on the Line. Thanks for having me, Angus, and thanks very much for all that you guys do in, in getting the veteran story out there. Rod, where did you grow up? I grew up in Elibana on Lake Macquarie near Newcastle. Well, I had a pretty, I would say, normal childhood. I always wanted to play rugby league, but parents were too worried about me getting injured like my father did playing Union, so uh, I was relegated to playing soccer, which I enjoyed, but that always gave me a bit of a spirit and a drive to then find something else that I'd be interested to do, something that would challenge me. And and luckily, uh, my mother got me into Army Cadets when I was at a young age of about 14. From there, I I started to fall in love with all things Army. And what was your childhood like? You know, your interests, your hobbies? I would say it was a very vanilla childhood. I was very fortunate that I had I had both my parents growing up. Initially, uh, my biological mother died when I was very young. Fortunately, my father met my now mother a few years after that. They had a small business and we just grew up and thought that was all very normal, um, having sort of three different sets of grandparents. And tell me a bit about those grandparents because I understand your grandfathers served. Yes, they did. So my on my biological mother's side, Carola was her name. She is German. Her grandfather fought with the German army in the Second World War. He was conscripted sometime midway through the war that I can see, and he was then sent away. He was in an airborne unit. From what I can find, it seems that he jumped into Crete. At some point after that, the officer that he worked for, so he was a batman, which is an officer's assistant, he got in trouble or his officer got in trouble, so that, so the story goes, he tells me or told me. He was then sent onto the Eastern Front to serve with a machine gun company there in an infantry unit. Yes, it's interesting talking about German paratrooper units. And of course, the first airborne invasion was Crete, you know, of a grand scale. Yep. And the fact that your grandfather survived because the, the paratroopers were elite forces and basically they were just deployed wherever there was a problem. Yep. And the Germans had plenty of those. <laughs> basically after the first year of the war. That's right. A- and the casualties and the hardship would have been devastating. So I can understand, sadly, why he didn't talk to you a lot about his time. Did he talk at all later when, when he found out that you were joining the military? Yeah, so that that was kind of the point where he opened up to me, particularly when I joined the army myself and I was a paratrooper. That's when he started to open up to me about his stories in the military, in particular the, the times fighting the Russians. On the other side of the family, though, that was particularly interesting was my other grandfather, Jim Henderson, who was a padre with the army. He served up in Bougainville and all around the Solomon Islands too. So I, I kind of had a, a grandfather on both sides of the war. Well, certainly the Bougainville, I mean, just working up in New Guinea, that was just terrible terrain. Absolutely. And for any of those guys to have served up there, and even though he was a padre, he was still a target to the Japanese. That's right. In fact, they were even worse because they weren't armed. Mm -hmm. And yet they went wherever they were needed. And and often that was right at the front where we were taking casualties. Yeah. Very heroic man. And I understand later he put his life on the line, you know, saving people with the – with the floods and things in Maitland. 
He did. That's right. So there was a quite a catastrophic flood in Maitland when they were in our army duck traveling down the street and they hit some power lines that were submerged and the signal man and the navigator on the army duck, sorry, a policeman and the signaler, both were thrown overboard and he dived in and, and rescued both of them. He was then awarded an MBE. I'm fascinated by your German grandfather. Mm-hmm. Being a paratrooper, not many of them survived the war. So how, how did he survive or where did he end? I know he was on the Russian front, but how on earth did he survive that? So after being sent there, he, he used to tell me stories about how the people that got sent out as reinforcements, because they were also having a lot of problems maintaining or getting men into the fight, they were getting younger and younger every time. And they were just young kids that thought that they were invincible. And when the shooting would start, he would tell me about hearing that thump. And that was the bullets hitting these young kids. And he said there was nothing that he could do to help save them. He just kept his head down, is what he said, and was lucky. And a lot of it was luck. He got shot in the back of the head. He got shot. Most of his calf was missing. He was very fortunate to survive that. And he did because he was able to get away from from the Russians and surrender to the Americans. I think you said he was shot four times. Yeah, shot a, shot a whole bunch of times. Wow, That's right. Guy. It's interesting talking about surrender. And I've shared to uh, to listeners on this podcast series before how my dad, I mean, he was fighting the Japanese in the war. After the war, he then went to Germany to represent a whole lot of German manufacturers mm-hmm. with their tools in Australia. And they liked him because he was a serviceman and, and he was fighting the Japanese, not the Germans. So he got on well with them. And one particular supplier told him the story how he had been in command of an armoured convoy and he was given orders to surrender. The war was over. And the German adjutant that gave him the orders said that they had to go down this particular road, which he knew would take them east to the Russians. And, you know, the Germans were very uh, fanatical about maintaining their orders and their discipline. And this guy said, well, I have an an armed company here. And if you want to argue with them, we're surrendering to the Americans. <laughs> and for the same reason that your granddad, you know, is alive, I mean, he probably surrendered to Patton's Third Army or someone because they pushed forward the furthest. Yeah. It's amazing how these simple choices in our life, like your granddad, mm. you know, just through his experience knew how to sort of survive. Yeah, he would have been a fascinating person. And, and I imagine the trauma he would have carried. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, but yeah. but then... The irony that his grandkid, you, is then going to be para qualified, and um, yeah. it's one thing to join the military; it's a totally different level at elite to be a troop paratrooper. So yeah. good, good on you. So I can see you're sort of drawn to the army. I mean, Mum says you can't play, you know, rugby league, which, with respect, yeah, I mean, the army you actually learn to kill people. So, you know, you've got this wonderful heritage with your grandfather. I mean. Your cadets, does anything else draw you into the military? It was about that time. You see it all over television with shows like Tour of Duty, I think was popular back then and movies like Platoon. And you just think that you are going to be invincible and you, you're going to go away and have these great, these great adventures with your mates. So when I was in cadets, I started to enjoy that, went and did reserves with an infantry company in Newcastle. And then from there, I always wanted to join infantry in, in the regular army. And it was actually my time in cadets. Well, my parents obviously wanted me to go across and, and do training as an officer. And I was a cadet under officer in, in the cadets. And I, I was always finding myself getting in trouble because I was back down in the ranks wanting to do things and wanting to do the obstacle courses and the training with them. So I I thought from that point, if I wanted to you know be on the tools, so to speak, I needed to be an enlisted soldier. And that's why I then realized infantry was going to be for me. I wanted to be a soldier. I wanted to be the the person that was going to be up the front to do the fighting because I was so naive. Then everything sort of shaped me towards that schooling wise to join infantry as a basic soldier. And then I did in in 95, I went away to Kapuka and they had about 15 positions available. If you finished Kapuka, if you marched out, then you could go to infantry and I was selected for, for one of those positions as well. That was when you joined the parachute school, was it not? So it was after that, after Kapuka, I went to School of Infantry and did my training there for another three months. And I was never interested at all to be a paratrooper. It, I understand. It was something that I didn't like heights whatsoever. And I was actually slated to go to two hour. I was looking forward to that challenge. And then my girlfriend at the time, my wife now, the course fellow that she was going to do. And at the last minute, she said, I can't go to Townsville. So it was either 
go up there without her or change units. And the only other unit that I was able to go to was, was the, the third battalion. Yeah. I just figured that I'd go there and, and say maybe I didn't want to jump and go to a different unit. When I got there and saw how hard it was for a new bloke to start in an infantry battalion back in the mid-90s, I figured, you know what, this is hard enough doing it with 10 of my mates. I don't want to go to a whole different unit and do it all by myself. So I'm not sure if it, if it was through courage or bravado. It It is what it is. I stay there and the next thing I know, I'm, I'm staring down the ramp, the red light on a caribou on my parachute course and the dispatcher yells go and I jumped. You said something about your mates. What gets you through all this is your mates. Absolutely. Look, I talk about this with the work that I do at the Wobble Mall. You're there with the people around you. It's not necessarily about your unit or about your country, the things you do when you go away. And in in those moments, even in the aircraft before you jump out, there are moments where you can't hide fear. The bravado falls away and you realize that you're there with your mates and you don't want to be that person who lets everyone else down. So there's someone in front of you just as scared. There's someone behind you just as scared, but you're all in it together and you you just have to do it. So after you became para-qualified... Where did that leave you? Within the 3rd Battalion is the only real position there and you go back to your unit there in Sydney. It was a very interesting time as, as a young, naive bloke that grew up in Newcastle meeting a whole bunch of different people from all different backgrounds or all different nationalities I hadn't been really exposed to and they're a really good bunch of blokes but I did have a lot of growing up to do and a lot of, a lot of learning, that's for sure. Tell me, when you became para-qualified, what was that celebratory drink like? It was interesting. So the drinks they give you at the third battalion at the day was called a Shat Special, which is you go down to the boozer at the at the unit, they pour in all different amounts of spirits into a glass and they top it up with beer and you've got to stand up on the table and skull that in front of the whole unit. You know, trying to hold it down is the challenging part. It's a very interesting initiation. I'm not sure how that works in modern day soldering. I would suggest that it doesn't anymore. It's probably very unsafe, but it was a sign of the times. Did you and your mates all line up together to do it? Normally you would go down there in your section lots and once you'd finished your parachute course, they would get you all up on the table to do it. I was fortunate that I was up there with a couple of mates. So, you know, it's not about being first to finish it. It's about finishing it. And then after that, you sort of stagger around and they keep topping up your drink for you with whatever beers that you have. But I don't remember too much after that event. I woke up the next next day in my room and they were taking us out on a run after that. So, But you can do that when you're 19, 20, right? Yes, it reminds us of that scene out of Band of Brothers where Sobel orders them after having the spaghetti breakfast meal to suddenly run up Mount Curraghi. And, of course, we know what happens then. So, Rod, let's move on to your first deployment in Timor. I was on a promotion course at the time and we got called back just a little bit early. We noticed that there was trouble happening up to our north with Timor. We could read it in the, in the papers, not a lot of internet back then, but we knew there was trouble brewing. When I got back from course, I was told that we would be deploying to Timor as part of an operation there to help stop the violence. Got a whole bunch of equipment given to me I'd never seen before, the new night vision goggles and the lasers we had on the night aiming devices on our weapons. Put all that on and, and off we went straight to Darwin as a staging area to get ready to go into Dili. And it's that point we started to acclimatize for a couple of days and learn this new equipment that we had. We deployed into Dili around September of 99. Now you were amongst the first wave of troops going in, weren't you? That's right. We were with... Uh, the 3rd Battalion, so the first troops on the ground were also the special forces around the airport and two RAR group came in to secure the airpoint of entry. Then they fanned out and secured the sea point of entry. So we came in on the Jervis Bay, that catamaran type thing. Actually, I remember when the SAS went in because it was the first time we'd sent troops abroad seriously for a while. I'd been in myself in the 80s where nothing happened and now this was a big deal. And I remember noting with interest how it was on mainstream TV, the SAS. I mean, they even interviewed some guy who'd been shot who was talking about, well, I checked my wound and I was okay and I pushed on, you know, typical SAS bravado. But in fairness, you didn't know what you were going into. That first wave is always the hardest. That's right. I remember the night before we left in Darwin, John Howard gave an address over the TV. He was emotional in that address as well as he expected that we would have a lot of casualties and certainly the intelligence briefings we had. And throughout the whole time in Timor, some of the intelligence briefings we had were saying that we were going to be getting into quite a lot of trouble there. So we expected to go in with the fight. We prepared for that and luckily we didn't have to. 
Yes. I mean, how would you rate Howard? I thought his leadership at the time was first rate. He certainly came up and saw us before we stepped off and, and took his time to walk around and shake our hands. And, and of note also was Kim Beasley. He was there as well as the opposition leader, and he also made himself available to us and said good luck. Yeah, Beasley was a very good Labor defence minister. He was. I think, you know, you could have been happy with either because they had a respect for the military. They certainly did, yeah. I think it's very decent of these politicians if they're going to send you off to war to put your life on the line to actually turn up. I always remember Eisenhower going around and meeting the uh, paratroopers in the 101st before they went because he, yep. he knew they'd be the first Americans to fight at D-Day. We were the first off into Dilly, Maine, and I remember stepping out the gates and thinking I was out of my depth. Like I said before, we were, we were there with our mates mm. and we had, to, we had to keep pushing on. At the end of that first day, we made our way to the stadium in the centre of Dilly was Alpha Company's objectives for that first day. And the training just kicks in. Absolutely. You do everything that you're trained to do, stay in your formations, cover yeah. your arcs and look after each other. As you say, like we had the stadium as the objective, assess the situation, then move on to the next objective. And I imagine, well, you tell us, how did you feel at that first night? Completely out of my depth. I'm not sure if that's the right word to use, but we were doing the job for real at that point. And our first objective that night outside the, the stadium was to secure a alleyway. And normally when you're doing that sort of stuff back here in Australia and exercise, there's a very defined enemy and you know what happens. And here's women and children walking around with, you know, their bags. They're not necessarily the militia or enemy. And we just had to make allowances for that uh, on the go. Uh, there was a lot of gunfire around Dilly, the first few nights, especially sporadic gunfire around, particularly out near the hills, but it was not necessarily in, an, in our location around the stadium. Yeah, so I, I imagine that night vision gear would have been pretty handy. Absolute game changer. So yeah. we could see everything, well, through one monocle. There was many times that we'd be walking around and the, and the locals had no idea that we were even there. And when you are up there, you had a couple of close encounters. I did. I did. We were, one time in particular, we were doing some uh, security for the journalists at the Turismo. We were standing on the front gate and there's a moped that came by with a couple of dodgy looking blokes on the back and noticed them come by a second time. And I said to the guy next to me that if they come by a third time, we're going to stop and pull them over. And they did. So we walked out on the road and pulled them over and got them off the bike. And I was trying to get them to, to lift their hands up so we could search them. And as I was doing that, he kept putting his hands in his bag and trying to explain to him that's not a good idea. And, and all of a sudden he pulls out a hand grenade. Oh, shit. Um, <laughs> pretty much what I thought. Well, a lot goes through your mind when that happens and time does slow down. I didn't think that shooting him was a good idea because there was people in the background and at that range right in front of him, it would have hurt those people. Also, if you shoot someone with a grenade, they drop it. But look, it was off and not. Fortunately, the pin was still in. I thought, what now? I grabbed the grenade off him and pushed him over and we dragged them both inside and searched them. And there was a photo that one of the journalists took of me at that point after we were searching them all. So it was a little snapshot in time that I get to show the kids. But it was a very, yeah, another one of those close moments where you're sitting around normal, all of a sudden it all goes pear-shaped. But isn't that the military, you know, like 99% of your time you're sitting on your ass and there's 1% of absolute bedlam. Absolutely. Do you remember that grenade? Can you still sort of picture it falling? It was a big round bulbous grenade. I grabbed it out of his hand. I didn't want it, <laughs> certainly didn't want it being dropped. Even going back to your point about sitting around 99% of the time, we were sitting at the, the stadium there sort of resting and all of a sudden a few rounds cracked over our heads at the stadium and we weren't from sitting around doing absolutely nothing to running out on the road, moving towards this gunfighter to find out what was going on as well. Very much so, 99% boredom followed by 1% adrenaline. Was there any explanation that this guy could provide you with for carrying a live grenade? Not at my level. My level was more so to secure him, secure the scene. We offloaded him back to the military police. For all I know, he might have even been felon tool with carrying those weapons. But at the time, no one was allowed to carry weapons. They were dressed in a manner that alerted us to these people. They never came to us and surrendered these weapons at any point. They were driving past our position, pointing things out. So, And how much more time did you spend in Timor? Another couple of weeks in Dili and we, we saw some pretty amazing things there. We were led by the locals to a militia stronghold there and we had to search and clear it. And then one of the platoons, one of our other sections from our platoon found some bodies in a well and we got called down there to help secure that scene as well. And then coming back, 
came across some militia coming down the road and we had to arrest them, pull them out of the vehicle and arrest them and then escort them all the way back on foot to the stadium. And so the locals were now trying to attack the very people that we were now trying to protect and they were the militia that we were trying to protect from the locals. Who could well have played a part in the massacre of those people in the world. Possibly, yeah. 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 I mean, you obviously looked into the well and saw the bodies and you could probably smell it. That's right. Did you spend much time around there or, or basically you're then on to disarming these guys? No, once once that area was secure, we didn't need to hang around that area too much. That was the first time I'd, I'd really had any experience with death and absolutely it was a horrific scene what yeah. they've done to these people to put them in the well. We then moved back down to the headquarters and that's where we came across these other militia that we pulled over. And That's why you were sent to try and bring some law and order back into that situation because it was Absolutely. clearly out of control. And again, another one of those 99% border month. We were standing around keeping the crowds back from the headquarters and the car came down the road and all of a sudden I'm at the front door of the car with these five people in there not knowing if they had weapons ready to yeah. hit us and I was just at the wrong place at the wrong time yeah. I was the one who had to go out and stop them and, and here we are again going through another high adrenaline moment. Yeah, but, very exposed. Yeah, the first week in two in, in Dili was particularly adrenaline fueled all the time and then we started to move out to the border regions after that. Did you have an interpreter with you to help you with the language with these people? No, no, yeah, not very, at all. Very difficult. Yeah, we did have one little a local boy in the first few days at the stadium who showed up just to hang out with us. His parents were obviously missing. Don't know what happened to them, but he was able to help us with speak to some of the people, particularly when we started to hand out rice, but also those five people that we captured, we took back to the stadium. We secured them there and he was able to help us ask them questions about why they had certain things on them, yeah. And and what, what did you give them a couple of chocolate bars or yep, something? Yeah, absolutely. Like yeah. Absolutely, or the Russian packed chocolate, yep. So, Rod, if we move on, you're in the infantry and then you decide to transition into air crew. That's right. So I realised when I was out on the checkpoint towards the end of my time in Dili, I'd like to challenge myself and do and do something else. I saw a Black Hawk come in and resupply the position up top. And then when we returned home, I was I wanted to go and do something else within the unit, but found that we were back out on the ovals doing the same stuff that we'd been doing before we left. I decided I needed to challenge myself doing something else, and it was the aircrew side of the house I was interested in. And I had pictures of door gunners up on my bedroom wall when yeah, I was a kid. From Vietnam. That's right, yeah. yeah. So I decided that is something I wanted to do. Never thought I'd be able to do it, but applied and yeah, got onto the course. Yeah, it's something that Huey from Vietnam image, you know, um, Apocalypse Now is just, yep. it never leaves you. So you went to Oki to do your course? That's right. It's a three-month course to do the basic module to, and we were training on the Huey. So here I am one day, I'm, I'm counting radios at a Q store in Derbatain and the next minute I'm hanging out the door of a Huey, calling in an aircraft, having fun. And one of the instructors right there just said that, just love being here, I can tell. And it was, it was like that. You could easily fail something on the course and get sent back to unit. There was people there that happened to, and I figured I'm just going to enjoy this for as long as I'm on the course. And if I make it through, great. If I don't, then I've got some cool photos to go back to unit with. Did that instructor give you any wise words of wisdom? He obviously saw that I was really enjoying myself, but one of the instructors on the course when we first started did say, look around because all of you will be in an aircraft accident at some point. We didn't believe it at that point. We thought that that seemed unbelievable. So it was certainly something that came true later on. It's funny you should say that. I remember when I was in the Navy, we were doing some course down in Penguin here in Sydney, and I remember a commanding officer came in and he said, look, just pay attention here because we're training you to go to war and you will be in a war at some stage or we will be in a war. So I was lucky I didn't go to war, but obviously we have been in wars and as these guys could see, the veterans, we're training now for what is going to come and sadly there are going to be more wars. It would be wonderful if we didn't have to go to war, but men being what they are around the world and especially today, we've got a resurgence of the Cold War in the Northern Hemisphere. It's human nature. Yeah. Do you remember um, where you were when 9-11 happened? I do. I was actually still, as part of my aircrew training, I went down to the aviation medicine school in Adelaide at Edinburgh there and I was one night I was going to sleep and one of my mates had come back from the boozer and he was talking about how Iraq had attacked America and they were bombing parts of New York and I thought that was very odd he'd obviously had a few too many beers so I didn't bother getting up and opening the door and talking to him 
The next morning, though, when we got into work, it was yeah, obviously everywhere. And in fact, that day on that part of the course was about air crash and air crash investigation. So here we were seeing it on the screen and then as part of our lessons, and then we would all go into the break room and watch it on TV in live. It was, it was an amazing uh, day. Before we leave Timor, you'd been in Timor initially, you know, as an infantryman. You did have a few more deployments back to Timor, but, you know, with the Blackhawks later. That's right. I went back again in 2003 for a three-month trip over Christmas again, and then my replacement was injured, and so then I was uh, asked to stay on for the next rotation. So it was six months all up. And what had you noticed in Timor then compared to when you first were there? Completely different, and, and my role was completely different as well. I got to see how the other half live. Being air crew, we had air-conditioned rooms. Yeah. It was all very lovely. And our primary role there was to provide aeromedical evacuation and support. So we would spend a lot of time on standby with our aircraft ready. The infantry guys that were there from 6th Battalion used our aircraft as, as a training platform as well. So they got a great opportunity to do a lot of concurrent training as well there. We did patrol inserts and all that sort of stuff along the border, but it was a reasonably benign time. And like I said, our role was primarily for aeromedical evacuation support. Right. So, so there weren't any sort of hot extractions or anything? Not necessarily. The intelligence picture, again, painted a very different picture to what reality was. But we did do a lot of hoisting in patrols and out through the jungle areas around the border. By and large, it was quite benign. Maybe they should send the intel guys out to the field a bit often. Absolutely. If we look to sort of wrap up your exposure in Timor, I mean, you're an interesting guy because... You also get yourself over to Pakistan, which is pretty challenging. That's right. It was one day we came to work expecting uh, the boss to tell us that we're winding down for the year. And the next minute he tells us, pack up our stuff. We're going to Pakistan. We don't know how long we'll be there because there's been a, a 7.9 earthquake. Tens of thousands had been killed. So we went over there as part of a coalition to assist with more air medical evacuation and moving things around. Yeah, look, I remember the Pakistan assist operation. I remember in particular that the climate, you know, that the weather was just shocking. Your positioning was remote. Difficult country, difficult terrain, difficult time of the year. Tell us how it really was. We'd had no experience in flying around the snow. We'd had a lot of experience flying around high density altitude environments, particularly around New Guinea. We didn't have the equipment for it. So we had to suddenly get a lot of cold weather equipment to fly around the northern regions of Pakistan. So within two weeks, we were actually flying around Kashmir, all up there around the border, the disputed regions with Pakistan and India. It was absolutely amazing to go from Townsville to Kashmir in two weeks and be part of that coalition. Yeah, the, the military will do that for you. Absolutely. Yeah. And look, the Taliban are up there. Were they a bit trigger happy with you? They were. The Taliban would take any opportunity they could. In fact, an American aircraft we were with a, a Chinook was shot through their rotors. We very quickly started painting the uh, boxing kangaroo on the pilot's doors and then the Australian flag on the engine cowling. We would also wear Australian insignia around when we were in Rawalpindi or Islamabad. It certainly stopped them shooting at us when they saw that we were Australian, but also on top of that, we started to take cricket sets out with us everywhere we went. I love the cricket, yeah. Good. In one particular place in Mira, we showed up to a refugee camp, would have been about 20,000 people there, and we, we pulled out the cricket bat. And they just thought, well, you're Australian, you've got a cricket bat, you must all be Ricky Ponting. Mm. And out they came, they selected their 11 finest and they scratched out a, a pitch and came in with these fast balls that would take your head off. And we couldn't play cricket to save our lives, most of us. And yet there we were on the side of this mountain playing cricket with the locals in Pakistan. Isn't that just the most surreal thing? And what a good thing to do. There's 20,000 people that you just had a positive influence with. Good on you for bringing out the cricket bat and using some good old Aussie sporting ingenuity to solve a, a difficult situation. So I understand that you actually injured yourself in Pakistan. Yes, I did. That was on New Year's Eve, actually. We'd come home flying up in the mountains and we had to have a bit of compulsory volleyball game against the Americans that were there. And whilst I was playing volleyball, I came down on someone else's foot and rolled my ankle and snapped off a bit of the bone oh. with that. They said I couldn't fly anymore and they gave me the option of staying there and operating the radios or returning home. Oh, and hard choice. After flying around Kashmir, I decided that I would return home and with that, I was unceremoniously dumped at the airport with my jacket taken from me because there's only so many jackets they had, so they needed mine back and I had to kind of find my own way back to Australia. So after your Pakistan experience, 
What was your next posting then? Because you were overseas again. Not long after Pakistan, we actually deployed back to East Timor in 2006. They were having problems with Ronaldo running a coup. And so we deployed back there for, it was only supposed to be a few weeks on my rotation. We were the second rotation to go over for the aviation support. By the time we got there, we ended up spending three months. And we were there at the heliport back in Dili again, where I'd been all those years before. Very different type of scenario. This time, we, there was a lot of gang fighting. One particular time we got called over as the QRF to go and monitor some gang activity that happened in the streets. Whilst we were there, these gangs were fighting each other and attacking. We had nothing we could do to stop them. We were trying to direct the police to help break this up. One of our pilots actually came down into the flare to blow these people with the rotor wash, came down nice and low, and it stopped them from attacking each other with machetes. You know, some poor people were singled out and chased down and attacked. All we had at our disposal was the aircraft. So we came down on a low hover and we'd, we'd try and blow them away and it literally worked and helped stop these people from being attacked. Yes, good crowd dispersal technique. Rod, can you talk about your posting to New Guinea later? We were flying one night when I was in uh, Sydney in the Special Operations Squadron there, 171 Squadron, and we got called back in to come and see the boss at the operations cell. We thought this is very unusual. We must have done something wrong. And when we got in, we were told that we would need to hurry up and pack our stuff. We'd be going to Papua New Guinea to conduct search and rescue for a plane that went down there. So we quickly packed up our gear. The next day, the aircraft had been packed up by the tradies and was ready to load aboard a C-17 out at Richmond. And that afternoon, I think it was that we were in Port Moresby, ready to go out and search for this aircraft. We knew from flying around in New Guinea, we used to go there nearly every year to conduct training there, that you don't take off after lunch. You try to avoid it at all costs because that's when the bad weather is. But by the time we got all our aircraft serviceable, ready to go, they wanted us to, to launch, to go and look for these people. So we got our disaster victim identification team on board and we launched off to Kokoda to try and see if we could get in there. And we couldn't. By the time we got over the hills towards Kokoda, we could barely get into Kokoda itself. We certainly couldn't turn back to Moresby. So then we got into the Kokoda Bowl. We're lucky enough to find Kokoda Airstrip through the cloud and fog. It stands out when you're above it because there's a large pine oil plantation next to it. We got down and landed there and then we were socked in overnight. But it was fortunate that we were with the AFP guys because they had the government credit card and they were able to, to pull it out. And we went and stayed next to Kokoda Airstrip where the trekkers start their treks. We had some sort of goat curry that night and a couple of cartons of warm local beer. And it was really good to, uh, to have a yarn to those blokes because they were from the disaster victim identification team. And I'd actually worked with them at a mass grave that I went to at Passab in Timor only years before. So the exact same people. So we were able to catch up and, and share stories about that event as well as what we were stepping off to. Did you end up finding the victims? We did. The next morning we got up around dawn so we could make use of the best weather. And then we got into the crash site. They'd, they'd actually found the aircraft crashed before we went over there. So we knew we were going into recovery mission before we got there. We put the team on the ground. We loitered for a while. We came back and then started the process of removing the bodies. And what was the particular story behind this crash? There was nine Australians who were about to start their journey on the Kokoda track. Their aircraft got into trouble trying to land. They tried to go around and flew into cloud and flew into the side of this hill, almost directly across from the Israva Memorial on very high hilly terrain in yeah. hospital. You know, Rod, it's funny talking to you because it brings back so many memories I've got. My godmother, probably one of the most holy, beautiful people I've ever known in my life, her first husband was a highly decorated American pilot, Don Lee Sutliff, and he was killed. So he received the DFC, the Distinguished Flying Cross from America, and was personally known to Roosevelt, highly regarded, and he crashed in New Guinea, was never found. And I always remember my godmother later in life, because I had a photo of him with his actual medal mounted and, and I gave it to her and she would look at it daily and say to me that she often wondered what had happened to Don and did he suffer and, you know, thinking of her because he named his plane after her, Gloria. You know, those mountains were treacherous yep. and, you know, claimed so many people and continue to do so That's and, right. and certainly claimed him and what were you flying, like a caribou? Or? And we were in the Blackhawks at that point. Oh, okay. And, oh, yes. and our role was to, was to drop in 
you know, the medical teams if, if needed. But like I said, unfortunately, at that point, we knew it was recovery of the bodies. Mm. The disaster victim identification team from the AFP, we got them in, we got the bodies out, and then the aircraft parts out for the investigation back to Moresby. It was a very satisfying, professionally satisfying mission to do because here's these people that were civilians and they had an interest in Australia's wartime past, enough to go and trek this arduous Kokoda Trail. And they didn't expect to lose their lives that day and it would have happened in an instant. But it was great for us to go there as the ADF, as the military, to go and get these civilians out and bring them home. So, Rod, you also did an underwater escape training course. That was another one of those ones, a near miss that can come out of nowhere. I had done the course about five or six times before and this was whilst I was down in, in Nara. I was, I guess, cocky, overconfident, rushing my drills as you do after you've done something so many times. And one particular time I couldn't get my seatbelt undone and managed to jam it while I was underwater and upside down. Uh, it's easy to do. Absolutely. And people who have done Hewitt before will know just how awful it is. There's not many people out there that enjoy it, but mm. it is good realistic training. You need to do it. But this particular time I got stuck and I put my hands on my head expecting I would be taken out of there magically. As we're told, if you get stuck, you put your hands on your head. So I did. And the safety diver tried to release my seatbelt and couldn't. And so I started to panic and thrash about. And eventually the safety diver behind me undid the seatbelt from the floor. But at that point I was fighting for my life. I was thrashing around underwater. And then I, I just remember hitting the, the floor of the helicopter because we're upside down. It was on the mm. roof and I floated up there. And I remember thinking, why doesn't someone get me out? And that was it. I was done. And the next thing I know, I bumped into the side of the pool and that obviously dragged me out and I'd come to and I took a big lung full of air and it was a good experience of, it was something to tell you why you shouldn't rush and fumble the through the your panic drills. will kill you. Absolutely. Yeah. And, I, and I was done. It was hard to get back in a pool for a while after that. It's easy said not to panic. I remember when I was in the Navy diving and I was at the bottom of the ocean and the bugger just pulled my goggles off me and I just wasn't expecting it and I really freaked out. There's something about water. I, I was at Penguin again doing the, another Navy course. It was one of these survival things that, you know, you're in a ship and you hit and suddenly there's a hole on the side you've got to plug the hole. And I remember how quickly the cold water and the dark and the noise and the disorientation, thank God that they were there to get you because you could have, you're probably only a moment away from, from death. It's weird to think about it, but I'd given up at that point and you have to make peace at that. And I remember it wasn't necessarily euphoric, but I was calm at that point when I'd realised, well, I'm, I'm done. I mean, and even though you'd been in combat, that's probably your closest you've been to death. Particularly in a training scenario, definitely. Yeah. yeah. How about we go to Afghanistan? Yeah, so I was deployed to Afghanistan with the Chinook helicopters from Sea Squadron at Townsville in 2012. And our primary role there was a combat service support by that point in the war. And that is, put it bluntly, we flew arse and trash around Afghanistan. That was our job. It was an important role to resupply the FOBs. We would occasionally do a few direct action missions, but at that point of the war, our primary focus was supplying the FOBs, which is the forward operating bases. It was still an amazing part of the world to be a part of. I never realized how beautiful Afghanistan could be with the mountains and the green zones. We were fortunate that we had exceptional pilots that were very experienced in that area too, so we could avoid by and large, a lot of the uh, the ground fire. In a helicopter, it's very hard to hear if you're being shot at because of the noise and vibration, everything that's going on. But there were the occasional pot shots and you would hear those with the crack past. But by and large, we were kept out of a lot of that, which was fortunate. We did do some work with the British Chinook teams that were over there with the Special Boat Squadron and the Afghan Army Special Forces. And we did some vehicle interdiction stuff which was quite dynamic and interesting. They had a whole bunch of aircraft overhead that would be able to uh, sense the air to look for explosives or drugs and they were able to take photographs of vehicles and see if they were laden so they would be a target of interest. So we would fly down and, and drop people off to pick up that, which was you know, very exciting. Afghanistan itself, in, in largely in our part, was, from my experience, was uh, combat service support missions. And any heavy landings in, the, in those we Chinooks? Did. We did. We were flying. We had a problem with an aircraft uh, over there, and it's not uncommon to have an aircraft that can be a, a bit of a problem with different parts. And we thought it was the flight control system of the Chinook, and we'd struggled with it for many weeks. This particular morning, there was a big jolt that actually went through the aircraft, which was unusual, and we thought it shouldn't have been that severe. And 
So we'd, we'd landed in a uh, forward operating base that was particularly dangerous that had only just been mortared. And we decided that hanging around there probably wasn't a good idea to call for the maintenance guys because they were going to get mortared again and big aircraft tended to attract mortars. Big target. So we, we decided we'd sort of nurse the aircraft out of there to a larger FOB. We were able to get engineers in. And it was on that transit, we were low and trying to stay low and slow and, and nurse the aircraft, but you can't afford to be lagging behind in Afghanistan. So we wanted to keep up with our American aircraft as well. And on late final coming into the FOB, there was another jolt. Fortunately, we're over the top of the FOB now. We turned the tail to try and come in and land, and that's where it felt like we were going to tip over. And the pilots got on the radio and, and warned that we were going to have a heavy landing, and we came straight down really hard. We didn't understand what the problem was at this point. We just knew we were going to hit. And when we came down, we hit with some forward right movement and tore off the right wheels. And I was on the right machine gun at this point. So it was all sort of happening very quickly it's on out, your side outside my window. It was it was all very uh, it was all re- very real at that point. And then the blades started to hit the ground. These are enormous blades. You know they're about a meter wide. Everything was kicking up and coming out of there. And I was trying to push myself away from the window at that point because I thought we were tipping over. And Cam Smith on the left gun there, his esky because we sat on eskies, came down and hit me there. But then when I was sort of laying on the floor, I realized that we weren't tipping over and, and sat up and looked out. Then I saw the fuel probe that had punched out through the side of the aircraft and it was spraying fuel all out down the side of the aircraft. And time to get out. I grabbed the first bloke next to me, this huge American bloke, and I, I said, you've got to get out. We, there's a risk of a fire. And I was trying to push this enormous guy out my window through the past the minigun. It was never, he was never going to fit. Cam did a great job actually behind me. He stop me from pushing him out there because the blades were still winding down slowly and there's a chance he may have run into those. My situational awareness at that point was very tunnel visioned after I'd saw the fuel and I was very focused on getting them out, myself out, and didn't realise. So as a whole of the crew, the pilots in particular handled it very well to keep us upright and on the ground. It was an aft LCT fire, which is a longitudinal cyclic trim, which basically holds on the rear rotor and helps it tilt. There'd been a couple of instances of aircraft breaking like this before and both came apart catastrophically in the sky, killing all the crew. We were very lucky this happened. Yeah, you're on the ground, yeah. Where we were, just above the ground, so yeah. So just finishing with Afghanistan, were there any other close calls or contacts? So I enjoyed supporting the Australians out there in particular. As I said, we were doing combat service support missions, but every now and then we would come across the Australians. And it was at those points, there was one of those times they were starting a new FOB out up near TK and we came in to land to give them a whole bunch of equipment and as we'd landed long of the position they wanted us to no one would come out to meet us at all and we were standing around the back of the ramp wondering why aren't you coming yeah, out come and get the gear they came over as we're chucking out the gear they came out of the radio saying we haven't cleared that area where there could be a minefield no one's coming out to get you so we we suddenly very very gingerly got back on the aircraft and we didn't want to go walking around out yeah. there and we actually took off and one of the one of the ramp extensions was nearly ripped off as we got off the ground because the cargo was still laying on it we didn't want to go walking around out there so that's that's one thing that really brought it home <laughs> being one of the air crew and so detached from what's actually happening on the ground you realize that it is such a dangerous spot for those blokes that were the grunts there on the ground and the engineers and everyone that was out there so and with that it was always great when we did pick them up to be able to give them cokes out of the esky and all that sort of stuff too so that was one thing i think about in kandahar we particularly we would be rocketed say twice a week the taliban used to fire these rockets into the base and kandahar itself was in an enormous base absolutely huge Uh, And so the alarms would go off, hopefully, if the rocket was inbound. And when you're there for the first few weeks, you you dive to the ground and you do all the things you're told and you wait for the explosion. Sort of by the end of your trip after six, seven months later, you don't get out of bed for them. You think, oh, it's it's my time, it's my time. And it would be pretty unlucky if that's the case. But there certainly were rockets that came in. You'd have to be pretty unlucky for them to hit you. And our aircraft did get hit by some shrapnel from one. Fortunately, we weren't here at the time, but it was only some minor cosmetic damage. How did you feel about wrapping up and coming home after that? One thing I remember about coming home, which is a bit unusual, is we had to go through security when we were leaving. And we went through security with our weapons and pistols and grenades, and we had to go through the metal detector and scanner, and we had to put them on the scanner, and we sent them through. Like, what's the point? What was the point of having a grenade show up on a screen? But anyway, coming home was great to see because I was a father by then and I had two young boys at that point. So it was very different at that time for me. I'd never deployed before when I didn't have children. Very naive, probably emotionally immature 
until you have kids, then you really understand. Changes everything. It absolutely. Yeah. It changes so much. And so I had two young boys, Matthew and Nathan, by that point. So my outlook on life was completely different. So to see them at the airport and to give them a hug with my wife uh, oh. took on a very different meaning from all the other deployments that I've been on. That's You'd sure. have a wet eye. Absolutely. Absolutely. How much longer did you stay in the army then? Uh, in Townsville, whilst I was there, it's unusual because I, I spent another year within the squadron there. My third son was born around that time. I was at work one day and had a really tight chest and everyone's saying, oh, you need to having a heart attack or something like that. And I thought I'm a bit young for that, but I'll go along to the aid post. And so I went to the aid post then and they hooked me up to all the machines and they said, that this is probably stress. And I thought, well, okay, let's, maybe that does happen to me. I've got three young kids now and I've got a busy job. Probably the first time I would ever actually thought about my mental health was at that point. And I went to see a psychologist and spoke about a whole bunch of stuff. But it was also around that time they ended up sending me down to Royal Military College at Duntroon as an instructor. I found it very difficult to come from the pointy end of the army yeah. to go down to instructing. And I had a lot of troubles adapting to that. Whilst I was there, I had a very good CO actually, who was able to give me a whole lot of time off for long service leave. And that gave me, afforded me a lot of time with my family, especially my youngest Ryan to spend time with him being his dad. I did struggle to adjust to the training environment, particularly with some of the RMC cadets. So I ended up becoming uh, an instructor there with the rehab platoon. We found a lot of the cadets there. Some of them had been there for two years in the rehab cell. The whole course only goes for 18 months. It was at a point where we were trying to make it clear to them that in a few months time, they could be in Afghanistan as a platoon commander. At that point, some of them just decided to leave the army and realized they weren't going to continue on. But the most rewarding part of that was actually those people who wanted to stay got them to rejoin their companies and graduate. In myself, I was really struggling, not only with that time as an instructor there in a, in a training environment, but with anxiety and hypervigilance. I, I was sent to a doctor in Sydney and within five minutes, he diagnoses me with post-traumatic stress and I thought well that's not really me I'm not I'm not someone who's had a problem with the things I've seen and done so I was kind of that made it worse I was kind of a square peg trying to fit into a round hole of this post-traumatic stress thing I didn't really identify necessarily with that they did say you know a lot of it is part of post-traumatic stress is the hypervigilance and anxiety it didn't really fit me that one so I found that really difficult so they gave me a lot more time off to try and work through those issues I ended up going to the uh, hospital at Wollongong, which they send a lot of veterans to for a mental health inpatient course. In my opinion, it wasn't very well handled at that point. I had a lot of new, a lot of new psychologists just out of uni w without a lot of life experience. And from the military, we had some police there and first responders, and a lot of it didn't really resonate with us. And that made things worse. And then it was kind of, we'll take this medication and everything will be all right. And, and you look at it from a male's perspective, we take a pill, you get better. So I was down that road and that was making things worse too, because I wasn't getting better and you're taking these pills. So that, you know, was, was a cycle in itself. The first time it really sunk home was a good friend of mine in Townsville said that this isn't normal. You, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be experiencing these things. From that point, I really started to pay attention to it and realized the stress I'd be putting on my family, my wife being angry all the time. And that's when I really started to dive into getting this fixed. My options at that point in the army, they said to me, I wasn't going to deploy again. I was not going to be in a flying role again. And that really upset me because that was who I was. That, That's that what was I you. Did. Yep. Uh, and my options were to go to maybe Russell officers headquarters as a sergeant or maybe on promotion or warrant officer. And that I thought was a career ending move. Yeah, you, you're a field guy. Absolutely. I didn't want to be serving coffee for officers at Russell officers. So I was given a medical discharge I kicked the can for a while, was fortunate enough to move out to a, a small hobby farm, but I was still finding myself, I needed to find a sense of worth. And I ended up working myself like I was an infantryman again. If I had to build a fence, I would build a kilometer of fence in a day. With the physical injuries I had from my time in the army, everything physically fell apart. And I was getting so many operations, then I realized there had to be a different way. that This wasn't going to last for long. So... I was fortunate that my wife worked with a great lady, Sharon Bone, who was involved in the War Memorial, and she told my wife, Kate, to get me involved in the War Memorial. And I'd certainly spent a lot of time there as I was discharging. The War Memorial is an incredible place for you to go and put your own problems into perspective. 
Because if you're having a rough day, you go and look at the up in the cloisters on the Roll of Honor, and there's 103,000 names of people who've had a lot worse day than you. So I found that really helped put my own woe is me problems into, into perspective. I, I looked at doing guiding there because I can, I can talk. It's, mm. Everyone that knows me in the army is probably sick of listening yeah. to me. I'll vouch for that. Um, yeah, I can always talk. So then I, I went and did the course to learn how to become a, a voluntary guide. And Good on you. it's fantastic. It really is great to do to take Australian public through the story of what is Australia's wartime past because only around 10% of people that come through the door at the Australian War Memorial Veterans. There is, you know, 90% of these people uh, haven't had any military service and it's great to be able to show them what people have done. And I particularly like the galleries of the First and Second World yes. War. They're incredible. And to take people through those galleries and to share some of those stories is is fantastic. And I'm still drawn to those World War One dioramas. I remember as a little kid, my dad taking me through and being a little guy looking up to see them. And I've never forgotten that. That's the first place I always go to at the War Memorial. Yeah. Well, there's some of the longest standing displays that they have are the, yeah. are the dioramas. Yeah. And it's, it's a place that I went to and I never spoke about my service there. I, if someone asked me if I'd served, then I would answer them at the end, usually at the end of the mm. tour. It wasn't until I started work with people from the history department helping out with the Chinook display as well as the peacekeeping section, because I was an easy to go to guy for that mm. sort of part. In particular, uh, one of the historians there, Dr. David Sutton, who was doing a diorama about East Timor, and he asked me if I'd know too much about the first people out of the harbour on Dili and the early days of Inafet. I looked at him and I thought, he must be uh, he must be having a joke here. And I said, well, not only do I know a lot about it, one of those little figurines will actually be me. And I couldn't believe it. And so uh, he asked me a whole bunch of questions about it. It's changed a bit since then. So I'm not actually going to be a little figurine on a diorama now. It's going to be of that scene. But it was a great opportunity for me to, to reconnect with my old commanding officer and my old OC and my old section commander from the 3rd Battalion. We, we all got in a room. We all talked about it with the historians to get that right. I'll certainly look forward to seeing that display, Rod, when it's ready. The Chinook one in particular I'm, I'm most interested in. That's working very closely with Carl James and his team there. And the Chinook display is going to be fantastic. It's going to represent all the Chinook deployments in Afghanistan. Yeah. We've got a history going back with Carl to 2010. Outstanding man. He is. So may I ask how you actually survive now financially? Because if you're giving all your volunteer work, I mean, do you have a pension? Yes. So... I'm particularly lucky that my pension is under the Veterans Entitlement Act. So I do get you know, 75% of my pay there. So I'm financially supported by DVA. In fact, I can't speak highly enough of how DVA has supported me through all this, all the physical injuries that I've, I've had and the surgeries I've had, as well as the mental health support has been truly first rate. So I'm fortunate enough for the financial help. Now I immerse myself in the war moral, probably too much if you speak to Carl sometimes, but I enjoy the work I do there either as a guide or with the military history section and right through to helping with the gallery development stuff. It, it, Wonderful. It, it is well, amazing. I mean, that's all volunteer. It's and my that, opportunity to continue to serve. What a great give back. Tell us about this hobby farm that you've got just outside Queen Bean with your wife and boys. It's my happy place. It is 16 acres of bliss. I've learned a lot by Google. I have sheep, I have bees, we have chickens, learning how to help a you give birth to a lamb whilst you've got your hand on the phone with Google and the other hand inside a sheep is something I never expected that I would be doing. But here I am, I, I had to learn it on the go quite literally. And it's still rewarding to this day. There is nothing better than, than sitting out the front, looking at the view and looking at your sheep. And, you got your and how old are your boys, Rod? They are 15, 13, and 9. Oh, great ages. Yeah, it's, great it's ages. busy. It's very busy. But yeah. again, like I said, I'm, I'm so fortunate that I get now this time to give to them, whereas so many other people out there, and this, I guess, is, is what a lot of veterans have problems with now under the different acts with DVA. And I know it's something that the Royal Commission is looking at. However, they don't get that opportunity of being as well financially supported the newer veterans and I can understand their frustrations there. So I'm very fortunate that I had a very good advocate that helped me with that transition through DVA. So Rod, how long were you in the military for? 22 years all up. I loved every moment of it, to be honest. Even 
you know, the times that you, you look back and you think that wasn't so pleasant and a lot of the things you had to see and do. But I truly believe that it is an incredible career to be a part of. You do get to truly serve your nation and that's what it's about. We've really enjoyed talking to you today. You're a great guy. I mean, you've served our nation everywhere of the time period that you were New Guinea, Pakistan, Timor, Afghanistan, you know, et cetera. And you're giving back today, which is just a wonderful thing. Thank you very much for your service. Thank you for sharing your time and in particular your life, the ups and the downs. I love how you bring out the camaraderie and teamwork because as we know, that's what makes the military what makes the military. Absolutely. And thanks very much for having me on. I appreciate it. Rod, it's our pleasure and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. I'm Angus Horden and you've been listening to Life on the Line. For more stories about Angus's father, John Horden, be sure to listen to the Season 3 bonus episode, Remembering John Horden, with Angus Horden. In previous years, we have also interviewed a few of the people mentioned in this episode. In Season 1, you can listen to my conversation with the Royal Australian Air Force veteran and now council member of the Australian War Memorial. Number 2, Sharon Bowne. One of our bonus episodes that year was The Eastern Front with David Sutton. And another popular bonus episode was Thomas Kay's interview with the now head of military history at the AWM in the conversation titled Australia's Special Forces with Dr. Carl James. Carl came back on the show in Season 2 in Beyond the Legend with Dr. Carl James. And for more stories about cricket while on operational deployments, check out the Season 4 interview, number 68, Harry Moffat, Volume 2. Follow this podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Life on the Line Podcast, on Twitter at LOTL Pod, and on LinkedIn at Thistle Productions. Our website is www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions, artwork by Big Cat Design, music by Dan Van Workhoven. Thank you for listening, and lest we forget.